If you are a jazz fan, you don't want to miss this. If you aren't, get ready to learn from an amazing man who's accomplished in a lot of ways. Today, bass virtuoso John Patitucci. Welcome to Church Burks and the good, the bad, and the ugly about church, religion, and spirituality with a dash of recovery for men. If you've ever had questions about the jerk, maybe a bit jaded in your attitude toward religion, well, you've come to the right place. Our host, he was an honors philosophy student, ordained a Presbyterian minister, planted three churches, taught at a prestigious university, but now, now he's just an aging curmudgeon who never quits asking the question why. The host of Church Hurts and Dr. John Bash. If you grew up in a traditional church at all, you'll remember a worship component called the offertory. To me, it seems simply to be a time for the music director to show off his highbrow classical taste, sometimes with a soloist belting out with way too much vibrato in a foreign language. With a little more reflection, it seemed to be a programming sleight of hand designed to cover that exact amount of time it took the ushers to collect the offering before the organ abruptly broke into the Gloria Patri, shaking the very foundation stones of the church with a refrain all new and were able to sing along without looking at the words. Modern liturgies, with which some would consider not liturgical at all, a conclusion with which I would disagree strongly, lean towards something less repetitive. I remember one time in a midweek service, the offering was the last thing to be done before I was to get up to speak. Um, this was the time, by the way, for a preacher to compose himself, double-check that his zipper is up, make sure the notes are in order, and grab a moment of prayer, remembering it isn't about him. Get out of yourself, turkey, my spirit would hear. But this Wednesday evening, the music director introduced a guest musician to do a solo instrumental piece for the offering. Doesn't sound too unusual, right? But the guest instrument was a bass. This should be interesting, I thought. And the bass had six strings, not four. Thankfully, I would be getting up in a few minutes to save things if it all was a flop. A few minutes later, I walked up to the lectern, wiping tears from my eyes, wondering what had just happened. Nothing I could say would reach the heart of people like what I had just heard. I would teach humbly, knowing that God had showed up already, thankful to be a part of the body of Christ. Welcome today to Church Church Day and that bass player and renowned virtuoso John Patitucci. Wow, my goodness. I was just thankful that they they didn't turn on the blender when I was playing. <laughs> John, I I want to start up by asking you to do something you just aren't that good at doing. Um, would you tell our listeners a little bit about the maybe the recognitions and awards that you've been given that meant the most to you? Because I saw the list, and we don't have that long, but I bet you in the midst of them, there were some some that really touched you. Could you tell me about one of them? I think uh, music and certainly improvised music and the music I spent my life being adopted into the culture of African-American music and um, jazz music, improvised music. The things that stand out are the relationships I had that shaped me, which it's funny how that works. Sometimes it doesn't work this way, but in this case, the sort of the, the what the wards represented, you know what I mean, uh, was far greater than the actual award, but it, it was the result of the relationship be, uh, with Chicory and Wayne Shorter, those two. Uh, gentleman, uh, shaped my career, shaped my life, believed in me, pushed me to become better, uh, were just so brilliant and genius in what they did that it totally influenced me. So, but I would say the last one that I got, it was a, it was a Grammy award a couple of years ago, uh, with Wayne Shorter's quartet. Now Wayne Shorter is one of the most incredible musicians ever in American music, not just jazz music. Some people would say that after Duke Ellington, 
the next generation. And Wayne is premier composer. You know, Miles Davis, Art Blakey, he changed music by what he was writing inside the bands that he was in. Every band, including Weather Report. And then his own groups. Uh, we've played for 20 years, his group, recently. His health has been a challenge, and he's not really touring anymore. But he just finished orchestrating an opera that we're going to do in the fall. He's not playing much, but he's still writing. We were oh, oh. on the stage at the Grammys. He was in a wheelchair. We had been worried about his health. He was, at that point, not doing as well as he's doing right now. He's doing much better. But I was afraid, because he's like a second father to me, that I was, we were going to lose him. I was in tears when they handed Wayne the Grammy. He kind of just passed it back to me. I was standing behind the wheelchair. The Grammy itself was too heavy. So he just gave, and, and Danilo and Brian, Danilo Perez and Brian Blade and I are standing there with our hero. Just the emotion that led up to it and all the stuff, and, and it was so intense. Because the record, it was a two-record set with an illustrated book, because he was quite a, he was a cartoonist also when he was a kid. Uh, but this book was based on something that he had vigured. He wanted the two record set with orchestral stuff with the quartet and the quartet by itself, plus this illustrated book, which was like a sci-fi cartoon book. Maybe one of the biggest projects he ever released. And I had been hoping in my heart, I was like, he's got to get recognized for this. He's not just because he's, he's much older than we are. It was because he's a genius, period. You're proving exactly what I said. I, to I said you weren't very good in this. I ask you to talk about awards you've received. You end up talking about Wayne Shorter. You, you know, when I first met you, you were a lot younger and you were living in California. True. And you'd walk in and, and it's like, I had never heard of you because I'm not a jazz guy. And all the musicians, they were just, you don't know who's here. John Patitucci's here. And I'm like, so what? You know, yeah, who, I'm like, oh, who, who in the world's John Patitucci? Oh, he got bass player magazine, you know, player of the year. I mean, you were you were pretty young, but actually, remember back then? I think you might have even been in your thirties, and that yeah. felt old for musicians at that point. But you've you've won awards like that like number of times, like the best in the world. Where do you go from there? It's like really, I, I've just been the best in the world by my peers, basically. Oh, I don't know. I I think a lot of the older guys set me straight on that early on. They said, "Don't believe, <laughs> don't believe anything the press says about you when it's good or bad." Because they don't know. Now, awards by your peers is a beautiful thing to be acknowledged. But to me, the ones that meant the most were in the bands I was in. We have four Grammys in the house. Two of them were from my association with Chicory and his bands, and two are from Wayne Shorter and his groups. Those are the things that mean a lot more to me than any kind of base things. You know, that's wonderful and all that, but the community and that family vibe and the music that was created by living life together on the road and sharing and and learning actually from each other how to live together, how to create this music, and to see that, you know, when you're young, you think it's all about, okay, I have to be the great, you know, you're thinking too self-oriented, and then you realize later on when you get around these masters that they're thinking of the whole all the time. They're thinking of the group and the community. And because they have that dynamic in their head, their music goes to the highest heights where somebody who's only thinking, oh, yeah, I got to play my stuff. Their music is not going to get up there because they're, they're trying to hold all the marbles, you know, for themselves. And it just doesn't work. And luckily, at a young age, I met these people who reoriented my, you know, they, they took part in pointing me in the right direction instead of being self so self-focused you know that's you hard talk, enough as an artist as yeah, so you talk about music all the time i want to do something a little different for a second you speak of community there i want to talk about community this is church hurts and um tell me mm -hmm. about um what kind of church upbringing did you have now now, I grew up with a very bigoted mother who had categories, so she would just look at me and say, his name is Patitucci. What kind of upbringing you think he had in church? He's a, you know Italian Catholic. <laughs> What's your story? I was. I uh, was. What was that like? Well, living in Brooklyn in the 60s, 
You know, I was born in 59. My older brother, uh, because he was the eldest, of course, he was encouraged to be an altar boy, and um, he did that. And poor my brother Thomas, who's an amazing guy, who became a pastor later, but not in the Catholic Church. He had to learn the Mass in Latin. <laughs> and I, I always wanted to be like him, so I decided if he was going to do that, I had to be an altar boy too. So I went in there. And then the and the mass changed to English. He was so mad at me. <laughs> you know. But anyway, we've quickly figured out after a while that, you know, in that period of time, you know, the cultural thing of the church, as opposed to the to the real spiritual focus of a church or the individuals in it, or I, I'm not so sure. A lot of those men who were the priests, I don't know what their real life. You know, and it's not for me to judge what, you know, the depth of their faith or whether they believed in God at all. They were so much culture. You were an altar boy, though. Yeah, I was, man. So I was around these guys. So I saw kind of, you know, how they were. shaky. You saw the shakiness of it. Yeah. And and also when I thought about when I grew up or as I was growing up and because at first I thought, you know, I had a spiritual yearning. And I thought at first when I was younger that maybe I wanted to be a priest. And then they told me the rules. And I said, forget that. I, <laughs> I want a family. I want a relationship and all that. So about the time I was about 15 and my brother was 18, we went to our parents and said, we're not going anymore, which was hard for them. They grew up Catholic in a very culturally Catholic tradition. Sure. And in New York, which is very you know, heavy. So, and the and the root of that was I finally, cheeky little 15-year-old guy, when I just went in to talk to the priest one day, and he said, well, you have to come in the confessional. So I went in the confessional, and I said, you know, bless me, Father. I did the whole rigmarole because I had it all memorized. And, and he said, okay, what is it? I said, well, I, I, I need you to teach me how to be close to God. I'm reaching for God. I want to know God. I don't want to wow. just feel like he's really, he feels really far away to me. And I know there's got to be something. It's got to be more than that. And he couldn't tell me. He just said, go back in the church, say five Our Fa- Our Fathers and three Hail Marys, and think about what it means to be a good Catholic. So as I was walking away out of the thing and out of the church, it's like a comedy thing. All I thought it was, wrong answer. You know, I knew at 15 that was not the answer. That could not be the answer. There's right. no way that that is the answer. I, I didn't I know what the answer was. But I knew that wasn't it. Okay, so I'm I'm remembering, and I don't know why you're not as old as I am, but I'm kind of remembering back. There, there was just a time, even with musicians, that in the Christian world, you heard that somebody might be a Christian. And it's like, oh, you know, Bob Dylan went through his stage, and and Clapton went through his stage, and but you'd hear somebody's a Christian, and it felt really like, oh, this is a, this is really neat. But for you. For you, it wasn't just about getting a label. I mean, you kept going with that question, and you you never let go till you got an answer. Tell me about that. What happened was um, we lived in the Bay Area, and there was a covenant church nearby called Hillside Covenant, and there were there was a young guy, two young guys. One was named Lon Allison, who wound up working in the ministry for years. He worked later on uh, in Chicago and worked with Billy Graham and some people like that. But he was a really great guy. And he had a music director, this guy, Jonathan Brown. Um, And they were really, you know, they were starting a church. They were going to start an offshoot of that church. But they started hiring hiring me to play at the church. So I'm playing. And I remember there was a guy who got up, he and his wife, and he had been strung out. He was a heroin addict. And his life was changed. And... He was talking about it, and his wife was talking about it. And actually, I know, I still know these people. They, they wound up being very good friends because later on, my brother wound up being an associate pastor of this offshoot church that happened from this youth minister and the music minister. So, but the the music minister was a really cool guy, and he was way into Andre Crouch, African American gospel, incredible music. You got to know that in the Bay Area in the seventies. There was, I mean, Andre was from the Bay Area. He was down in L.A. already. But there was the Hawkins family. There was a lot of incredible gospel music happening in Oakland and San Francisco. Mostly Oakland, I think. But 
that was all around. So when they played me a Andre Crouch record, I freaked out because I was, you know, coming out of R&B and jazz and blues music. So that was like incredible. And we were playing some of those songs. So I was like, okay, this is, then I started asking them the same questions. And they said, no, it's, you never have to disconnect your heart or your mind to be in touch with God. But, but we can show you, you can read the Bible is a, is, it's like a, a very long book, a love letter to you. It's for you to know him. And they started showing me stuff, but, and more importantly, people can say stuff like that, but if they don't live it in front of you, you're like, okay, whatever. These guys were really cool. Very kind. They cared. Not, not, they weren't just trying to convert me. Uh, they were hiring me before when I had lots of questions and we hung out and it was, it was never pressure. So after a while in the summer of 77, I decided I wanted, I wanted to make a commitment like that. Jesus went from being an idea or a far away concept to being, you know, my savior, a different, definitely a different thing. And and it was, um, a big change. I mean, it was a huge thing. And the funny thing was that summer, my brother also made the same decision through somebody else completely. He's three years older than I, and we have always been close. We've been like twins. So that was major that we both found that through different people. And then we were afraid to bring it up to the other. And when we did, they were like, Oh, you too. So my brother is still somebody in this life that I, he's one of my biggest heroes. The, what he has walked like in his life. He's an example of a real man of faith. His wife is an amazing woman of faith. The stuff they do with the short term adoptions they're doing right now for children in crisis whose parents are having really bad troubles and kind of things they do that you'll never hear about. You'll never, you know, these are the kind of people that never get written up in the papers because they don't do something drastically, horrendously destructive. They're really trying to to live this life. I want to get to what it's like to really have more than a casual relationship with Jesus in your profession in just a minute. But first, um, I, I do want to mention uh, if you uh, if you're listening and you want to hear more about John John John's list of um, musical uh, accomplishments and his records and books um, I want to get to the teaching story just because uh, John has a new book out called Walking Bass if those of you want to learn stuff it's um, one of his latest things but just go to johnpatitucci.com and it leads you everywhere it's a real well put together website but also need to mention that. I work for Standing Stone, Um, and it's Standing Stone. That's the working with the frontline workers, with people like uh, John's brother and others in the ministry who they sometimes get discouraged, and and they need a confidential place and someone to talk to. And and that's what I do at Standing Stone. Um, It's offered free to those that we work with because of your generous contributions. And uh, we really need uh, support at this time. As we're trying to come back from the pandemic, uh, the struggles of what church is going to look like and what's happened, there's lots of people who are in need who are in ministry. And um, it's easy to do that. Just go to churchhurtsand.org, and there's a donate button. Um, We would love to have you as part of our team. I personally would love it as I just want to do this work in every minute that I can because it's needed now. So I want to thank you ahead of time for that. Also, if you're listening, uh, if you would subscribe, pass this show on to a friend and say something nice. Uh, You you qualify for three free sins. If it's a lie, say it something nice anyway. But uh, that's another show. But having having said that, John, um, I want to get back to music here for a second. And I I always remember it was kind of a funny thing. I I think it was. Uh, an interview with Bono, I think, with U2 one time. And he was talking about how all musicians want to play another instrument. You know, the drummer really wishes he was the lead guitar player and the singer really wishes he could play the drums and, and how all the musicians just wish they were something else. And But then he mentioned about Adam Clayton, uh, the bass player. He said, but Adam, he's always just wanted to be a bass player. It's all he's ever wanted to be all of his life. What about you? I mean, because, you know, I mean, you really 
people just say your name and just base is attached to it. Is that okay? I love it. I mean, I, I will confess that I wanted to play drums too. My, I mean, yeah, my dad wouldn't let me do it, but uh, I had bongos and maracas. And I tried the guitar for a little bit, but I'm lefty and the pick and the right. It's, it, my brother was, again, uncannily, you know, prescient in a way. He, he was the one who said, look, you should play the bass. You don't have to use a pick. You can, it's going to be, it's going to feel better for you. And it did. We got a bass. It was a Sears Telstar. It was 10 bucks. It was hanging on somebody's wall down the street in Brooklyn. And I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. One word about Bono, too. I met Bono. We worked together one time with B.B. King. It was a live thing in tribute to B.B. And we played When Love Comes to Town with him. And Bono mm -hmm. and The Edge were there. And Terry Lynn Carrington, the great drummer, and I played with them. And she's a terrific, amazing drummer. Uh, a real artist and a real um, link in the history of jazz drumming and other things. She's an amazing person. And an amazing activist, too. So here we are, and I meet Bono for the first time, and I'm, you know, I'm just talking to him, and I said, man, I really find it really refreshing the way you are very candid and sort of very humble about what you believe, you know. And uh, he was talking about all these things, and we were talking about grace, and he was uh, really totally down to earth. Great. And so we, we enjoyed that. It was fun playing. Um, with the bass, the reason why I love the bass so much is the bass is at the epicenter of all the music. It's with the bass and the drums. I, there's something I always tell my my students. Rhythm is the delivery system for everything good in music. You'll mm. never have a good melody without rhythm. You'll never have a good bass line without rhythm. You can't have a great band without a great drummer. Uh, but the bass player is kind of like a drummer, too your job in that epicenter of the music, it's involved in all the aspects of the music. It's, it's, it's uh, to transmit the rhythm, but it's also to transmit the harmonic information. There's the bass line should be a sort of counterpoint to what the melody is. There's all these things that happen. I think when you first pick it up, sometimes people think, well, it's only got four strings on. It's going to be the easy one. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, you can play it at a low level your whole life if you want and just sort of, hammer around on it is fine but once you get deeper into it and the subtleties and the profound nature of the instrument and what it does whether you're playing electric or acoustic bass whether you're playing funk music jazz music blues music or classical music the bass is at the center of the music it it's always hit me that the six string bass that you're known for because it's your signature six string bass the yamaha has they also, they did that early in your career. I mean, that that was pretty early on. It was acknowledged. Uh, well, I have to set the record straight, though, I, and I always do this. The, the absolute pioneer was a man named Anthony Jackson. He's still around, and he's one of the greatest bass players in our history. He was the one. He was the Galileo. He was the one who had the first six-string bass really made that was designed by a bassist and and tuned like a bass. And everybody was telling me he was crazy. He was going to get tendonitis and everything. And I heard him and I thought, wow, this, this is amazing. But I knew that he, he had stumbled onto something or created something, I should say, that was, it could be used in many ways. I felt like there was a lot of potential for this to be done in many different stylistic ways. And when I got the job with Chick Corea, orchestrationally, I saw the need for something wider because at first it was just three of us. So it was the keyboards, the bass, and the drums. Unfortunately or fortunately, I had to solo after Chick every time. And I was like, this is impossible anyway. And I want to have more low notes because in those days, the synthesizer players were taking over the world. They had these massive sounds. And I wanted some low notes too. And they had, for a while there, they had lower notes than I did. And I waited, well, I'm the bass player. I want to play the low notes. But then at the same time, I want it to be able to be melodic if I have to solo and have something that sort of peeks over the top of all that texture and the thickness of the keyboards and the drums. So it was an orchestrational, you know, kind of a taking a chance because it all of a sudden there are two more strings on your instrument than you're used to. And just those two strings creates a lot of landscape that you don't know. 
And it was a bold move. It was very reckless because I got the instrument about two weeks before we went on like our real first major tour. And man, talk about baptism of fire in my room. Hours and hours on the stage in my room trying to figure out how to work this thing. <laughs> hey, scary. all right. While we're back in that period of time, I want to get vulnerable for a bit because our time's running out. Um, but you know, it looked like things were going so good and, and, uh, but again, it's church hurts and we talk about the pain. Uh, your life was falling apart a little bit when we met. Um, and you know, you, there's a lot of ways you were kind of almost looking for how do I quit this, you know, everything. Um, tell me about that. And, and kind of how you struggled your way back through and you stayed in the church and and got out of surprise at the other end. But tell me about that hard time. I suffered from a thing of always wanting to grow up too fast. Uh, not I'm not going to get into all the problems of uh, what happened, but I did get married too young. I made a I sort of even felt it in the pit of my stomach that I shouldn't do it, but I did it anyway. I didn't listen, you know, I think I felt it, you know, you feel that thing. It's not an audible voice, but you feel it in your whole body that it's not the right time. And I went ahead and tried to sort of order my life my way in my timetable. And boy, did that not work. So um, that was nine and a half years. It was very difficult. And I respect, I, you know, accept responsibility for, for doing that. That was you know, you can. Res- that's the part that I can accept responsibility for, and maybe some other stuff too. But we we don't have time to get into all that. However, it brought up a lot of things. It made me question a lot of things. I, you know, I went through a lot of soul searching and a lot of uh, even therapy, trying to figure out why that sort of thing happened and why. I would make those sort of errors and mistakes. And uh, it was deep. It was tough. And that's when I met you. Yeah, we were we were talking a lot in those days. And that was very, very, very uh, painful. Because I, I think I went into, then I started to analyze a lot of the ways I thought about things. And not just family of origin stuff, but because ultimately you have to take take responsibility for your life. You can't just blame it on your parents the rest of your life. You have to you have to admit what's yours, what you're holding, take responsibility for that, and grow. But I can't tell you, uh, you know, we don't I, I, we don't have time to discuss the the pain. And and you know, I have to say, a lot of it, I take responsibility for trying to outrun God's plan for my life. Yeah, John, I think um, what I remember the most about that was. Partly, you know, was just the awe kind of you had to listen with. Um, I, I heard today somebody criticizing the word awesome. Everybody uses the word awesome. And they talk about, no, there are, you know, who really deserves awe? Let's start with God there. But then we get in the idea of, you know, when people, you know, you get in those situations where people are in awe of you on the one hand, on the other hand, fortunately I wasn't because, you know, I wasn't a jazz aficionado. You were a person who yeah. was hurting, who I cared about and you were authentic as could be in your pain and committed as a believer to do what was right at the time and just navigating your way through that. And I think authenticity is something in you that I think really is reflected in your music as well. There's just not a lot of fake John Patitucci you know, John Patitucci running around. I hope it's the real thing. Yeah. And that's, you know, you could say warts and all, you know, that's, <laughs> and I, I think that came from my parents too. That's a great thing that they instilled in us. They were, you know, my dad grew up very poor, son of an immigrant. My mom grew up, her parents were very poor as well. So then, you know, when they, people started to say, Oh, your son, John, and they go, well, he's just our son, John, <laughs> you know, that's who he is. You know, they didn't really, understand the whole music thing and they didn't really give it too much weight they cared more about me in my life you know what was happening and my brother and my sisters who are amazing have always been a source of incredible strength 
you know, and then of course, when Sachi came into my life, we've been married now 26 years, man, everything changed. And, um, and that's, that's an incredible story and an incredible gift that, you know, in the book of Joel, God says, I'll restore the years that the locust has eaten. Boy, did he. And now we have two daughters, 23 and 20. That's a whole nother story. It was tough to finally get to having children. But yeah, I, you know, I can honestly say God is a God of second chances. Well, I wish we had time to talk about Sachi because you know you hit the jackpot, and I don't think Sachi wants us talking about her anyway. But it's been fun to see you guys live a life of um, not passive Christianity, active. And um, for our listeners, John has been involved in his church, in his faith, encouraging people for years. But I, rather than even digging into that, and we just have time for one more story, and I got to do this one. Tell tell me the story you, we talked about beforehand about you going back and uh, finding some relatives in Italy. <laughs> Talking about not being able to hide. Um, tell me when you went back there. We actually have a town that. W- w- what's your designation in this little town in Italy? Well, they made me an honorary citizen of the town in Toronto Castello in Calabria, and I brought Sachi, my dad, and everything, and his wife Lucille, my daughters. We had the greatest time. We did. Uh, a concert for the people in the town. And I think 3,000 people came to the concert, and there are only 5,000 people in the town. So <laughs> we did pretty good. But um, it was just an incredible experience. And I have a dear friend. It's funny. He just texted me, Sergio Gimiliano. He's a concert promoter in southern Italy, an amazing guy. And his his family have become family with us, and they have a hotel in Diamante, which is a little beautiful sea town right down the hill from where uh, my grandparents were born. And uh, just an amazing experience that was. I have to tell you one short story about Sachi because I have to say something. You know, she's an amazing woman, amazing cellist. Uh, She's my manager. She went back to school and got a degree in music supervision for film. She was a music supervisor of the film that I did last year uh, that just came out called Chicago, America's Hidden War, which I'm very honored to be part of. My mother, uh, who you did meet, was a very soulful woman. You know, New York, Brooklyn, Italian. There was there was only truth from her. She was like very cut through the garbage and just like, you know, she didn't uh, suffer fools and she was very vocal about it. So she said a profound thing about Saatchi when she met her. She said, wow, I met Sa- Saatchi and it was like, she's too good to be true. There must be something, you know, because my mom was very intense and she said, you keep waiting for the other shoe to drop, and it never does. She fell in love with Sachi. Sachi was uh, not only the healing my life, but my mother's, because my mother was so, you know, focused on her her children's joy and that they would have a great family and everything. And when they, those two met, they just really hit it off, and we, we hung, and they loved each other. So... It was very timely because we got married in 95. My mom passed away in like 99. So there were only four years for that relationship to, but it was just love at first sight. And they, they were really, they really connected in a beautiful way. And so that was very significant in a lot of ways because my mother was the epicenter of the family. you know. Well, uh, and she, um, she provided an amazing meal after your wedding, too, which will never be uh, forgotten by me. <laughs> and, uh, John, I, I just got to thank you for so so much, uh, just how how you give the people you care about and kind of always knowing, even with you moving to New York, being on opposite sides of the country, I know if I get in trouble, I can call John Patitucci. Let me say a few words before we go. With all the awards and albums and accolades John Patitucci has received, you'd think one of them would stick out in my description of my friend. Things like the Lifetime Achievement Award by Bass Player Magazine, or rather breathtaking, or Guitar World listing him as the number 20 of all time. But that's not what comes to mind. One day, John and I were out to lunch after he'd fallen in love with Sachi, and he asked me if I would perform the ceremony. Of course, I was honored, but then he squirmed a bit and he said, but I'd like to do it twice. 
John explained to me that he felt obligated to have a ceremony for his family and friends, which was going to take a while to arrange, but he didn't want to wait that long. So one afternoon in Irvine, California, John and Sachi and just a few friends gathered at the lake many weeks before the public ceremony. They took their vows and we all headed over to a pool with a barbecue by my home. I don't remember the details too well, but I'm sure I cooked some seafood and we opened a few bottles of champagne and everyone contributing something in this very private time. Now the bride and the groom could live together in good conscience for the weeks prior before going public. That was on May 7th, and it is the day they celebrate as their anniversary to this day. John and Sashi has, have never been off my prayer list since then. Not surprisingly, they have two very creative girls excelling in their life at this time. Both John and Sachi serve in their local church, having found their way in the and life and having been beaten up pretty well a few times. John runs into a lot of people around the world who are a bit starstruck when they meet him. They struggle for words, wanting to thank him for his giftedness and contribution to music, particularly in the heady world of jazz. They wonder what it would be like to be that good at something. So, so good. Your peers told you you're number one, but when John comes, when John times comes and he passes from this earthly band of the celestial one, filling the infinite space of heaven, John's hoping to hear the words of his savior. Well done, John, my good and faithful servant. And then Jesus will motion with his arm to reveal that place in the orchestra with a standing bass waiting, a six string bass tuned up and a lot of smiling musicians ready to play. So John will look for the conductor as Jesus nudges him towards his place. He catches out of his eye, something in Jesus other hand, a baton music conducted by Jesus. John now knows that he'll know the tune. He's been practicing it all of his life. What about you? It's worth a thought. For Church Hurts and this is John Bash. Go and enjoy God today, won't you? Well, that was worth a thought for sure. And brings us to the end of this edition of Church Hurts and. Next week, it's rumored we'll be walking on the edge of controversy, stirring the pot of denial, and finding movement of the divine. Our host, Dr. John Bash, is a shepherd with Standing Stone, a nonprofit ministry committed to caring for pastors and Christian leaders at risk of leaving the ministry prematurely. Come visit us at churchfirstand.org. Tell us your story while you're there. Until then, remember, Church Hurts isn't the end of the story. Now go into the end and enjoy God today, won't you?